Hey, lovers! Welcome to TSPN. All right, so today we've got a lot to cover. We are going to start by finishing the timeline for the Masters re-recording debacle, right? So we released a two-hour-long episode, which is labeled the Masters Part 2, where Jesse got from about the sale of the Masters all the way up until the end of 2020. So we can do like a quick little recap on some of the hot touch points there, and then we're going to get right into the timeline so that we can finish that out for you. We are also going to talk about the Apple playlist drop that Taylor did this past weekend with the Tortured Poets Department coming out here in a little bit less than two weeks. And I do want to say with that, that just happened a few days ago. We are recording on Monday, April 8th. So happy solar eclipse day. Um, but we are, we've got a lot coming up this next week. So obviously the Torture Poets Department, Jesse and I are going to be in South Carolina. We've got um, to finish the lyrical analysis. So there's a lot happening. So if anything drops specific, like the Apple Music playlist that Taylor dropped over the weekend, and we do not cover it on the pod, check out our TikToks. Jesse Swift Talk does a lot. We'll maybe post some to the TS Pod Network TikTok, but it's going to be really hard for Jesse and I to keep up with all the action that's about to unroll, especially as we come up to the album release, right? Like I, we expect almost every day there will probably be something. There was even some stuff today with the typewriter potential lyrics being released. So just know that our episodes are not going to be the most up to date with that level of detail. So if you're like, oh my gosh, I'm dying to know what Anna or Jesse has to say about X, Y, or Z, we'll do our best in the next couple of weeks to try and be posting more actively to TikTok just so that you guys can get that without it being a week behind when it actually occurred. Um, and then the final thing that we're going to cover today after we talk about the Apple Music playlist and some of the things with TTPD is we're going to finish out our Tortured Poets Department draft. Uh, I'm really excited about this. Um, and so what we'll do is we will finish it out for you. And then that way on Friday, April 19th, when the album comes out, we will have all of those ready for you to vote on on the website. Once you listen to the album and you actually have a judgment on how good these songs are, you're going to choose between Jesse or I, which one of us has the better team. And then real quick, before we get into the Masters, I do want to announce that on April 19th, we will have a very special guest. KJ Miller will be joining us and we are actually recording that here soon. So we are going to do a ton of fun background with her. If you don't follow KJ yet on TikTok, she has grown a huge following. Um, she does a lot with uh, Beyonce. She even did the series like Beyonce for Swifties, which is like really helpful where she breaks it down like as if we're learning about Beyonce in the same way that a lot of Swifty creators treat Taylor's work. Um, and she's going to come on and this is her first really rollout of a new album as a Swifty. So not only will we hear her story of becoming a Swifty and really blowing up on TikTok surrounding some of her lyrical analysis and things she was doing early on with Taylor's work. But this is her first time with a Taylor album, right? So we're going to have a little party. We're going to celebrate Tortured Poets. And so obviously that will be a little bit pre-recorded. So when you're listening on the album release day, that will be a pre-recorded episode. But we're really hoping to jam pack it with fun and just celebrate the launch of the album with you on that Friday. And then, of course, Jesse and I leading after the album release will have plenty of other, you know, reaction footage, lyrical analysis. Like we're going to be slaving away for you guys once the album's out. So just kind of hang tight as we get through these next few weeks. But without further ado... We've got a jam-packed episode for today. So before we get started, though, with the Masters, Jesse, let's give a little update on Hazel, because for those who have been following along, we had to skip a week here with this Masters Part 1, Part 2. So if you're going back, you got to go back a couple weeks to kind of get caught up. But last week, Jesse was out because her dog was sick. So do you want to give us a quick update on how Hazel's doing and how you're doing overall? Oh my goodness. Yes. Well, shout out to you, Anna, because you did a fabulous job um, covering by yourself. I feel so bad. I was just not in the right space to record. Um, we literally had about 48 hours where we did not know if she was going to make it or not. And she's only two, two and a half years old. Um, she's a golden doodle and she's my baby. She's my dog. And um, 
Yeah, I won't get into all the gory details, but she just, it, it happened so suddenly and so fast and she was coughing up stuff she should not be coughing up out of her lungs. Um, no signs or symptoms prior. We took her to the emergency vet, barely made it. She wasn't even walking. Um, and they saved her life. They, she made almost a full recovery. So she is hoarse, like her, her voice is like hoarse when she barks. But um, other than that, she's coughing a little bit with nothing coming up. Um, she's on lots of medications. She had um, what they think is a bacterial pneumonia. So it, it was so scary. It was, so, I've never seen anything like it in my life. It was terrifying. Um, she was in the emergency room for two nights, two nights, I think, two or three nights. And we got to visit her, but she was very lethargic. Um, and now she's probably, I'd say, 95% back to herself. So thank God. <laughs> thank yes. you for all of your love and support, too. I got so many messages and, oh, it just, yeah. Yeah. Well, and honestly, the lovers can wait on the masters part three. Everyone was very gracious. And um, yeah, there may be times where I have something going on and, and it's a last minute thing. So we appreciate all the love and the support. And ultimately the show must go on. So right. I, uh, I kind of got tired of my own voice after doing a whole 60 minutes, editing back a whole 60 minutes. So I'm glad you're back so that it's, you know, split a little bit here. Um all right, great. Well, let's get started with the the master's part three here. Okay. So if you guys watched, we've done a couple parts of this already. The first time I started talking about it, I talked about the difference between Scott Borchetta and Scooter Braun. Um, and then we just went into kind of the meat and bones of what happened to Taylor's master's. Why doesn't she own them? And why is she re-recording? I really just did a 101 on all that. Yep. So we kind of got to the point of, um, it was a lot of back and forth. So there's a lot of back and forth going on between Scott Borchetta, Scooter Braun, and Big Machine Records, and then Taylor Swift and her camp. And her wanting to own her own masters, them telling her no, them trying to get her to sign an NDA that she did not want to sign. It's a lot. So I would suggest you guys go back and look at watch that before you listen to this part, because it might be kind of confusing. So I left off on her releasing Evermore, December 11th, 2020. So April 9th of 2021, Taylor releases the first re-record. So that would be Fearless TV. I think she released Fearless, Taylor's version first, to kind of say or show everyone that, hey, I'm fearless and I'm going to do this. That was kind of what I got from that, the symbolic nature of that release. Um, yep. Fearless leader, you know. Um, also, at this point in time, remember, Scooter Braun was toting around her masters around town trying to sell them and telling people that she's bluffing she's not going to do it she's not going to re-record to try to get them unloaded because he knew she'd re-record was so, this the same time though wait, wait you're talking about april of 2021 was when fearless or was that in 2020 um he sold them off again in october of 2020 so he did successfully sell them i should clarify that he successfully sold them off but as he was saying she wasn't going to re-record. He did not think she'd do it. So she Got kind it. So of her decision to start with Fearless and all of that was before he had the ability to sell him to Shamrock. Yep, yep, yep. That makes sense. Yep. And Fearless did really well. I mean, Fearless Taylor's version did really well. What I think it did ultimately is get people really excited for the other ones. Mm -hmm. Because if you, I don't remember as much hype about fearless tv coming out as i do like red tv and then speak now tv and you know 89 tv like it just got bigger and bigger and bigger well people didn't really know what to expect either and i actually love that she started with fearless which is her second album 
So just kind of thinking through like, are these going to sound the same? Is she going to sound the same? Is she going to mix it up? Is it going to be kind of a new version? And so going that far back in her catalog and just showing like, no, I'm going to stick to the original production and try and mirror a lot of the same vocals kind of set the tone for us. And then the vault tracks too. I don't know that we really realized what kind of vault tracks or how many treasures would be hiding in the vault tracks. So um, that was also kind of, again, once you do it once, then people get really, really excited for the rest. Um, but yeah, I do remember it coming out. And those were my questions was like, how how different will this sound? And is it really that big of a deal? You know, is it just going to be the album again? And obviously it was a big deal. And the vault tracks definitely make that happen for us. Mm hmm. I do think it's got a lit. I mean, you can tell, I can tell the difference um, mm -hmm. just because it's mixed and it's produced by Jack Antonoff and the originals were not. So from Fearless going forward, she has produced all her albums with Jack. And I don't know why she made the decision not to go back to Shellback and Max Martin for that um, and just choose Jack. But I don't think Shellback and Max Martin were on Fearless, though. I think their first one with her was. Um red but to the to the Was same it? point mm -hmm. i don't remember who the producers were then on fearless i'd have to yeah look it but up. to that same point i mean not only is um not only is their like newer production i mean the quality of music gets better i mean that album was released 28 2008 yeah um yeah 2008 so yeah. i mean to fast forward to 2021 uh 11 years 12 years 13 years yeah Th and she did 13 a really years good job. yeah you think she years? chose does she think she chose fearless because it was 13 years after the original probably knowing taylor i yeah. mean yeah it's it was it was really good it i I don't think it did as well as some of the subsequent re-recordings did just because i just don't think people knew what to expect like you said they were just kind of okay, this is what we're doing. But then she had a lot of success with it. So then June 18th of 21, so about two months later, she announces Red Taylor's version and she announced it on Scooter Braun's 40th birthday. Love that. Love, love that. A, we love well, our petty queen. We do. We do love our petty queen. Like, what can I do to ruin scooter's 40th birthday i'll i'll announce red taylor's version and that was far in advance like she was i believe she was going to release that on november 19th but then she moved it back to november 12th for adele because adele was releasing her new album um so she released it a week early but to go from an announcement in june to a release in november like that's not really heard of that often that's a long time yeah it really have, is mm -hmm. it really is yeah and well and the other it's just because she wanted to announce it on his birthday <laughs> she probably fucking did she um, did well and also the rev up for the red re-release too i feel like she had a lot more runway um, and there was a lot more for us to kind of get excited about, especially the rumors of the 10 minute version, maybe being part of it. Like I remember that time being probably cause it was so long that I remember it more than the other ones. Definitely. And like doing the vault, I mean, she did the vault for fearless, but like we were more excited about the vault. And I just remember being more hyped about that album in general yeah. and it's gotten better with each one the hype around mm -hmm. it and then the inclusion of babe which was originally saying it was taylor's song right she wrote it for red didn't release it with red but babe was then given to sugarland um and she did duet on that but um then you've got better man which was released by little big town so like the rumors that those were going to be vault tracks and we were going to get taylor's full version with just her voice like for me that was really exciting because at least we knew like obviously we're going to love all the vault tracks because we're swifties but some of them we glue on to more than others and those two like being anticipated i remember being like those are some of the first that i jumped to whenever we turned it on i my favorite song of hers of all time is all too well 
So when I listened to the 10 minute version, I, my jaw was on the floor. Like I, I can't even listen to the regular version anymore. I have to listen to the 10 minute version. I don't know about anybody else, but I can't do it. I have to listen to the 10 minute. I didn't listen to the 10 minute version right away because I knew it wasn't ready. Like I like legitimately, I don't think I listened to it for a couple days. Like I really? just, yeah, because I knew it's one of my favorite songs as well. And I just like, wasn't, I don't know what I was going through in my life. If I was stressed at work or if I actually had some shit going on, but I just remember being like, I am not in a place where I'm ready to absorb this. I went straight to it. It's a, it's a fucking masterpiece. That is her, mm-hmm. that is her magnum opus like right now, like I think, I mean, I I can't think of a, she has so many wonderful, amazing songs, but I cannot think of a song for me that beats it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and it's really like, even when she sings it uh, on the tour, like when I think about the Aeros tour movie, it is, I mean, she looks beautiful. I mean, she's giving queen vibes, like, like when she sings that for 10 fucking minutes, like it mm-hmm. is, iconic and obviously the lyrics stand on their own but i just think the fact that she had a 10 minute version and she released it that many years later and um and it's on her tour like it's iconic it it is and honestly like i made sure to pay when i was at the show the concert I made sure to pay like a lot of attention to what was happening because that was around the time when people were saying they were getting like amnesia from the show So Mm -hmm. I wanted to like make sure I remembered a lot. And that was one part that really sticks out to me that I remember because we were up further on the stage. So when we were watching her sing that, we were behind her and we we just saw behind her. And then above her was a full moon Hmm. and we were at Soldier Field. So it's an open dome and it was just spiritual. It was like surreal. Mm hmm. Yeah. So is witch allegations. <laughs> it was it was incredible. I love it. All right. I had this that I wanted to add in here just in case it rings a bell for anybody or it's important. But um, in September of 2021, she wore a dress called the Esther Dress in Shamrock by Reformation, which just sticks out to me because, as you guys know, Shamrock Holdings has her work. So anytime she has anything on that's a shamrock or shamrock related, we need to like clock that. So I don't know what that meant or what it was for. It just September, 2021, she had on a shamrock dress. Yeah. Maybe it was like her first clue to shamrock holdings owning it. Cause we didn't, did we know right away? We did. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's for, I I've always said that I think she's going to end up owning her masters at some point. Mm-hmm. So that could be a clue to that. Like, oh, like she started know. making the deals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Like, obviously, Shamrock owning it was a fact and not going to change. But yeah, if she started feeling as though that was going to be her pathway to earning it, then maybe she would start Easter egging yeah. those Shamrock clues. And I'm going to talk a lot more about her owning her own masters or the the fact that I think she's going to own her own masters when we get into like the lyrical analysis next time of all this, because to me, it's in the lyrics. If I ever have a theory or I can't, you know, come up with something or I'm stuck on something, I always, always, always just go back to the lyrics. And that helps. The brick you will shit if she says the word shamrock anywhere on Tortured Post Department. I cannot wait. Oh, I will lose it. Yeah, <laughs> I will. Lo- I will lose it. We'll call nine one one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, fun fact: Jesse and I will be together. If you haven't caught that for Yay. the Tortured Poets release, so we'll have some footage, some reactions, all of that. We likely won't be able to put it on YouTube. You have to um, pay for licensing rights for YouTube, and you have to also be a paid creator on YouTube. So, hello, go follow us and subscribe if you don't already, because that's one of the things that it would open up for us is the ability to do reaction videos on YouTube. But we'll post up on TikTok, and we'll do our best to like get it up on YouTube without a you know crossing. Will we be able to cut to like certain parts though? Nope. And YouTube just have like a second. Nope. YouTube knows really? I've tried to put like three seconds of something. Yeah, it will. It will. I've done a ton of research. It'll take it down. It won't even let it go up. It will mute. The Yuck. Whole thing. Yep. Yeah. How do people but, do that? 
they pay for it. Um, so big creators can do it. And you basically, what you do is you, um, you get access to a library and I don't know what the cost is, right? Like, is it $5 a song or is it a hundred dollars a song? And I don't know. We'll see. And it probably varies, but you would basically purchase the rights to the tortured poets department. And then either we, we pay for it out of pocket, right? Um, in, in theory, we would make money off the streaming of the video. So hopefully get it back. Or apparently some music is licensed like a co-op where the uh, person who you're licensing from gets a cut of whatever you make off the video. So I'm happy to be fully transparent with y'all once we get to that point as far as what that looks like, because I've been learning a lot lately. And there are tons of big creators that do reaction videos. And then there are ones who try and upload them and are like, what, what the hell? Um, so that's so that's kind of the secret sauce there is you can do it. You just have to pay for it. Also, I want to add to right now that if there is a trend or something you guys would like to see us do while we're in South Carolina together and we're going to be with other creators too, like Liz, Nikki, Courtney. Um, Ty, Ty the tourist Ty, Yeah. We're, I mean, Kenzie, Hannah. Um, mm -hmm. Kyle, we're going to be with a lot of different creators, you guys, um, wonderful creators. So if there's a trend or something you want us to do or you want to see, let us know in the comments and we'll do it. Definitely. Definitely. So, um, all right. So back to the shamrocks. I didn't mean to take us fully off track there. Shamrocks. Okay. So shamrock dress, just clock that. Um, it's on Taylor Swift styled on Instagram. If you don't follow Sarah, please follow her. She, is always up to date with Taylor's latest fashion. Um, she's amazing. Yes. All right. So she releases red November 12th and then on August 28th of 22. So we've gone almost a full year of red Taylor's version era, right? We're going to go through that era more when we go through Swifty 101. But like, that's, that's what we went through. We went through almost that was a, year. a long time, wasn't it? I didn't Very realize it was almost a fucking year. Almost now a year. she's been like feeding us nonstop. So maybe if rep won't come out till 2025, and we need to chill out because she's done this to us before. Well, and that was that time period was, it felt long too. And we had a lot of theories because we didn't know when she was going to drop something again, you know, when she's silent like that, it's just almost easier to make up theories. And I remember doing a TikTok about how she was going to come out with TS10 before another re-record. And I got so much shit and hate from people because they're like, there's no way she'd release a new album in the middle of her re-records and this and that. And I remember the the couple reasons I thought it was coming was Aaron Dessner, he posted about Carolina. So we, that's the only thing we got new was Carolina. Mm -hmm. We got yep. that in mm, spring, spring or summer of 2021, 20, but. Or spring or summer of 2022, mm -hmm. because she released at the end of 2021, November. So then it would have been spring or summer of 2022 that Carolina would have come out. Yes, that's right. 22. Okay. So Aaron Dessner put 10 exclamation marks after Carolina. And Aaron has always been one to really watch because he gives clues just like Jack. And I'm like, oh, that's TS10. Like, I think TS10 is coming. Then if you guys remember around July, I think they were celebrating um, Selena's birthday at a restaurant. And Taylor was doing this like 30 but she had her arms crossed in an X, like a Roman numeral 10. And really that's all I was kind of going off of with my theory. And I just kind of had a gut feeling. Everyone shit on me for it, everyone. And then 820. Don't you love when you get shit on? It's just like, I'm telling you, I've done political TikToks and there's nothing like getting shit on on Swifty Talk. I mean, I couldn't believe how many people actually thought that there's no absolute way that this queen could release a new album in between the re-records. Like, why would you ever underestimate Taylor Swift? Well, here's the thing. Now we've had the Eras tour and she has just proven she is unstoppable and invincible. So yeah, I mean, at the time, only only some of us knew. And yeah, I, I, I think there's a little bit different dynamics to online with Swifties. We've always been a good, calm, 
you know, supportive group. And there's always going to be right. ones who are going to shit on you no matter what. It's just, it's part of just being on the internet. Um, but I say all that to say, I do think at that time, you were one of probably very few creators who were making tons of theory videos regularly. And it just like, it wasn't the nature of um, what everyone was going through. So I'm sure you got a lot of, uh, yeah. a lot of hate. Yeah. And then, <laughs> so on August 28th was the VMA Music Awards. And she did this TikTok to Pink Venom by Blackpink. And she starts out in like the Evermore kind of era dress. And then it switches to her in like the diamond chain. Oh my gosh, draped in jewels. It was giving the bathtub in Look What You Made Me Do. Like every everyone, I'm sure, I, I'm going to speak for everybody right now, was thinking yeah. rep. Yeah, I um, I immediately thought we were heading into a new era, though. I, I was like, oh God, we're getting we're getting a new era. Because I, I thought, remember in my mind, I thought TS10 was coming before rep or anything else. Yeah, so you were looking for it. Mm-hmm. And... I know that she's ushered in new eras at the VMA Music Awards. Those are usually very big for her. Mm -hmm. And she's she's ushered in new eras there before. So once she got on stage and she won Video Music Award of the Year for All Too Well 10-Minute Version, she announces Midnight's. She said, my brand new album, my 10th studio album, will be out more information coming at midnight. So she didn't even say the name. So I got on TikTok and I <laughs> I said it's going to be called Midnight. <laughs> yeah. I, well, because she did say the name. She didn't tell us it was the name. So yeah, she said meet me at midnight or something, right? Yeah. Yeah. She said there'll be more information at midnight. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's the name of the album. It's Midnight. So I left off the S, but I was so close. <laughs> you don't know how happy I was when she announced TS10, girl. I was like, oh, you haters. Like, whatever, you know? Yep. Um, yep. However, I will say TS11 surprised the shit out of me. I will say that. Well, I, mean, I think it yeah. shocked everybody. But... Mm hmm. Yeah, I would say so. I for me, my biggest my biggest thing that I always said was she doesn't release albums in the spring like that. Like, what the fuck? It is April and we're getting a brand new release. She's always been a fall into holiday girly. And so um, that's part of why I wasn't expecting it was less because like, oh, would she do it before the rest of the re-records? Would she do it while she's on tour? Like, sure, you could debate that all day. But the fact that she announced a brand new album in February, I think that's why the VMAs are such a big thing for her because of the timing of them. They're in they're in right. that, you know, September, October era, era <laughs> those months. Well, and I think Fearless was about the only album that was a spring album that she's released. Yeah, well, right? that was a re-record. So that like doesn't count in my mind as far as when I'm thinking like the fall. And then Lover was started, she did that one more summer, like late yeah, summer. Yeah, that was more summer. Mm -hmm. But I need to talk, we need to talk about this shift because this spring now we have had Ariana Grande with Eternal Sunshine. We've had mm -hmm. Cowboy Carter with Beyonce. We've got Tortured Poets with Taylor. Now Billie Eilish is coming out with a spring album. We had Bleachers, a new album. So what's going on? There's a shift. There's some kind of shift right now. Yeah. Right? Because this is unheard. When Billy announced today that she had a new album coming out in May, I was like, what's going on with all the all the spring albums right now? But by big artists. Is that normal, though? I don't follow the trends of when releases no. happen by other artists. You know what I mean? No, this is not normal. I've never seen anything like this. That is interesting. Um, well, and to me, I would think that if you're going to have like a summer bop, you would release it like around this time, you know, but maybe not because you could always release it in the fall and then drop the single for the summer. Mm -hmm. um, interesting. Yeah, I just thought I'd bring it up. If any, if you guys want to make comments and let me know if that's weird to you or not, I, I just feel like it's a weird time of year for so many big artists to be dropping such big albums. Mm hmm. I mean, Definitely. Ariana hasn't released an album in years, like a couple years, you know, and yep. it's, I, it's just it's bizarre to me that between like m from March to the end of May, there's all these albums coming out. And it's just wild. Well, the women are going to rule the charts. Yeah, hopefully girl power.
All right. So we had the whole VMAs thing. Then at midnight, we found out it was called Midnight's. We got the forward. We got a couple pictures and everyone collectively lost their minds. My husband recorded me. It's on my TikTok. It's unhinged. Um, as most of my stuff is. <laughs> so then it was a different flavor of unhinged though. Like it was like, you know, you screaming versus just yeah. telling us some crazy theory. It was in raw, real time. No, actually, I'm sorry. I think I did a reenactment of that. The raw, real unhinged was when she announced 1989 Taylor's version. He was recording uh, you're right, for you're that. Right. Yep. But I, I, I remember leaping like from one couch to another couch <laughs> in my living room. I don't know why. When she announced it, I was, I left like, over like furniture. <laughs> Like a Tom cat. Cruise, Tom, Tom Cruise on Oprah back in the day. Do you remember when he jumped on the couch yeah. loving Katie or whatever? I think I was just in shock, but I just got up and I like jumped from the couch to like the lazy boy chair. And I don't know why. And then I threw stuff. I just started throwing stuff. And I'm like, see, see, I told you I was losing it. Eric should have recorded that. Yeah. But. Yeah. He probably had his phone dialing 911 and yeah, he was just scared. in case, just in case. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's so funny. My reactions are the opposite. Like I, whenever I go into shock, it's like frozen and you're like literally unhinged. I, I know I was unhinged partly though. Cause I think, cause I was right. And I was just like, but I will say when TS 11 was announced, I couldn't move. I was just like, yeah. wait, what? Like I, I was fully expecting reputation and I'm like, you a new dark album. on me for like a day. I was like, Jesse's not going to reply. And you know what? We'll, we'll be fine. She'll be fine. I, She'll recover. That's what I do. I went into hiding. I didn't, I didn't answer any calls, texts, nothing. Like I was, I was at, even like the episode we did right after I was out of it. If you watch that episode, I'm just kind of bloop, like still mm -hmm. processing. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. So okay. that will be a glimpse of us, you know, here in a couple weeks, once we hear it, I'm sure. <laughs> I know. on what the mood's gonna be yeah um for sure okay so september 27th of 2022 scooter opens up to npr so i'm gonna read that for you on this week's episode of npr's the limits with jay williams Music mogul Scooter Braun joined the former NBA star and his longtime friend to discuss his life and career. During the interview, Williams brought up about Braun's recent conflict with Taylor Swift, whose catalog he acquired in 2019 from her former, former label, Big Machine. Swift referred to the acquisition as her worst case scenario at the time, and she said that she was sad and grossed out by the way it had been handled in an impassioned Tumblr post. And we did read all of that in the last episode. Yeah, in part two. Mm -hmm. Shortly thereafter, she decided to re-record her early albums in order to reclaim ownership over them. So this is in quotes. When you bought the rights to Taylor Swift's masters, it turned into a really big thing, Williams said in the new interview. Somewhat understating a scenario that Braun has said led to multiple death threats being aimed at him and his family after Swift directed her fans to contact Braun and former Big Machine owner Scott Borchetta about the deal. If you could go back in time, would you have handled it differently? Scooter says, yes, I would have. I learned an important lesson from that, Braun responded. I think a lot of things got lost in translation. If you're listening, I just rolled my eyes. I think, <laughs> I think that when you have a conflict with someone, it's very hard to resolve it if you're not willing to have a conversation. I'm going to stop right there because in order to have that conversation, he required her to sign an ironclad NDA. NDA. Non-disclosure. Yeah, a non-disclosure agreement. And she did not want to do that, rightfully so. So she couldn't have a conversation with him. So the regret I have there is that I made the assumption that everyone, once the deal was done, was going to have a conversation with me, see my intent, see my character, and say, great, let's be in business together. 
I made that assumption with people that I didn't know and I learned that I can never make that assumption again. He's almost apologizing without apologizing like he's a narcissist. I feel yeah. like that's it, yeah. gaslighting. Al- this- alleged, allegedly he's a narcissist. We're, we're not doctors. Right, right. But- it's, I, it's narcissistic <laughs> tendencies. Yes. It's gaslighting. Okay, he says, in any conflict, you can say, I didn't do anything. It's their fault, he went on. And you could be right. You could be justified. You could say, this is unfair. I'm being treated unfairly. Or you can say, okay, I'm being treated unfairly. I don't like how this is feeling. I can't fix this. So how am I going to look at it and learn from it? I didn't appreciate how that all went down. I thought it was unfair. (laughs) Unfair, really? But I also understand from the other side, they probably felt it was unfair too. So I choose to look at it as a learning lesson, a growing lesson, and I wish everyone involved well. And I'm rooting for everyone to win because I don't believe in rooting for people to lose. I think she took always rooting for the antihero right from that quote. I just love that she is like the poet laureate of our time, right? And he says yeah. things like a learning lesson, like bro. And I'm not good at English. All right. I, I I know English is my first language and I say the most dumb shit sometimes. But like if you like what you just read was a lot of fluffy words, like yeah, a, a learning lesson. Um, well, and she yeah, says just in the song, she says, I think it's time to learn some lessons. Mm-hmm. Like she totally know. takes bits and pieces from these interviews yeah no it's a good call out too um well he um this is before he lost all of his talent right we're still in 2022 okay yep so swift's claims that braun subjected her to incessant manipulative bullying for years and that he and borchetta were holding her music hostage to stop her from re-recording it were not addressed in this interview. His statement of regret wasn't exactly the apology Swift and her fandom may have been hoping for, but it's probably the closest they'll get to one. Now, with that last statement, I'm almost wondering if he is under some kind of NDA. If he can't talk about some of that. What do you mean? Like he's under an NDA for what? I think he might be under some kind of NDA because it says... Swift's claims that Braun subjected her to incessant manipulative bullying for years and that he and Borchetta were holding her music hostage to stop her from re-recording it were not addressed in this interview, meaning they couldn't address that part. Yeah. Or maybe so, he just told him it was all, he maybe he just said these things are off the record. Like you, you're not allowed to ask them whether or not because I was wondering who he would sign an NDA to. Well, here's where I think it happened. I so Taylor did not want to work with Shamrock. We already talked about this because whatever she did with Shamrock, some of the royalties were still going to Scooter. So she mm-hmm. had told Shamrock that if you ever get Scooter out of the picture completely, she would talk, right? So I wonder if sometime between 2020 and 2022, two years, they had some kind of deal go down where scooter exited shamrock fully yeah because to clarify if you're not remembering from the last even though he sold to shamrock made his whole 300 million back he also was still tied to long-term royalties for those and so the idea being taylor wasn't going to even entertain any conversations with shamrock they had sent her a letter or had tried to get in contact and she said i'm not going to be in touch with the Shamrock side of things while Scooter is still in the picture, while Scooter is still profiting off of her work that he had bought and then sold and was still getting royalties from. So um, that's what you mean by potentially him getting out with Shamrock. Right, exactly. And I think that the timing of this article, September 27th, 2022, was after she announced Midnight's was coming out, but before Midnight's was coming out. So he knew, he had to have known that there was some shit on Midnight's that had to do with him. And there was. Mm, Maybe. Yeah, the white collar crimes. Yeah, vigilante shit is about him, 100%. 
I mean, karma is about him. Let that stuff I'm going to get into with the lyrical analysis, but, and I'm going to get into more with the lyrical analysis because she's kind of guiding. If you really listen to her lyrics, she guides you on what's happening with the business end of it sometimes. So there's some things that she says that is leading me to believe that she is still working to get back her master recordings. I know she's re-recording and she's owning them that way, but do you really think Taylor's going to let it go a hundred percent and just never try to get her real masters back? I don't think so. That's not in her personality. I feel like she, uh, she's a seal the deal, put a rubber stamp on it, call it a day until it's done type deal. Yep. And if she had to go about it this route, then great. We have two recordings of, you know, the same album. Who cares? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. But, okay. So then we have October 21st, 2022, Midnight's is released. Um, Her 10th studio album. Uh, November of 2022, Taylor is legally allowed to re-record Reputation. Okay. So... Another Shamrock reference, 3-17-23, St. Patrick's Day, Taylor Swift starts her heiress tour. Why would she start it on that day? It's lucky. And she likes the Shamrocks. I mean, I don't know, I'm losing my mind. Yeah, there's no other reason other than to point us to Shamrock Holdings. Like, when yeah. I saw that that was the start of her, her tour, I, yeah, I lost it. Like, I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. my goodness, this is such a big thing um on 5 5 23 she announced speak now taylor's version at the nashville show i believe you were there the night before right or the night after the night after that was the night one then she announced it and i was at nashville night two and we were crazy enough to think she would announce another one because why the fuck not (laughs) (laughs) right she could like just because of the whole midnight's mayhem with me which was the rollout of the midnight's track names people started to realize that the word may was underlined so then like there was a lot of discourse in theory land about is may going to be mayhem like is she going to try and earn back all of her masters really quickly um you know re-record everything get it all out so that during the era's tour she could own the work that she's singing so that i think was a little bit of that but now we understand i don't think that really matters <laughs> she's like i'm not gonna i'm not gonna rush this this is gonna go out the way it needs to i don't care that i don't own reputation i don't have a reputation taylor's version i'm still gonna have a full reputation set regardless right and i i really struggled with how is she gonna do this tour without owning all her work i really thought she was just gonna drop everything now because it just yep, didn't exactly. make sense to me on how she would do it but then you go back to the lyrics And she says, I'm taking my time because you took everything from me. So she's saying, I'm taking my time with the re-records. And that made more sense. Like I said, when you go back to the lyrics, it'll just make more sense. She loves a slow kill too. Like, I feel like this is not, like it would be in Scooter's best interest for us to have gotten all the re-records already and be over and done with like two years ago. Mm -hmm. He's dragging, she's dragging it out. Yeah. And you know what? She should. Like, we fucking love it. It's It's been bringing the fandom together. It's been bringing out, um, you know, more excitement. So why not? Well, and people that weren't around for those eras or didn't, weren't big Swifties or weren't even fans, they're getting to experience those eras now. Mm-hmm. Which is when incredible. When I think about, like, like, the idea that, like, she'll wear something and it will be like, is that rep coded or is that, you know, speak now coded? And, it, like, we didn't like this is easter egg layers right like we used to think she was entering a new era because she would change her look but now we get to like see things and think oh is she referencing an old era so it's this kind of like nuanced like theory land that it's created and obviously once the re-records are done we won't have that anymore we won't be able to like nitpick like is this pointing to you know is it going to be debut next is it going to be rep and so it's fun she should keep it alive as long as she can I will say it's weird, though, that we've gotten a lot of bookends. So like for, you know, mid, for the Midnight's album, it was TS, hashtag TS, Midnight TS, right? And now mm-hmm. we have bookends again because it's debut and reputation. So the first album and then the last album that she didn't own. 
There's something yeah. to that. And then there's something to the fact that she announced Speak Now on 5-5 five, five, and then released it on 7-7. Seven, seven. Yep. The doubles, I agree. man. I agree. Well, and then TS-11, that's, you know, there's something with like the double numbers. I don't know. There, We've got to find that out soon because and we still aren't sure. Like the 3-3 three, three, that um, on her 33rd birthday, her Instagram post, she was holding up the two fingers mm -hmm. or the two hands, each holding three fingers up. Um, and you know what? Maybe she just was saying, I'm turning 33, guys. Maybe that maybe there's nothing to it. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's Taylor. That's that's Taylor Swift. Something yeah. she meant something else by that. I don't know what, but yeah. So okay, so on July seventh, she Speak Now was released in Kansas City of all places because that's where you know Travis Kelsey is. Um, it was shortly after that that he put her on blast on New Heights podcast, and they started mm -hmm. dating, and then. August 9th of 23, we have 1989 announced in L.A. L.A. never got a thank you post, which is still very weird. Um, and she walks off stage with a glass of white wine, which has always kind of represented 1989. So 10, 27, 23, 1989 was released, 1989 Taylor's version. And it's exactly, what was it, 10 years since the original? It's on the... It's on the anniversary of, of the original. It's on the like, anniversary. Mm -hmm. I think it would be nine. It came out in 2014 and then 2023. So it would have been nine years later. Nine years. Okay. But you're right. It was the exact same day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, I don't know about you. I, I loved. Okay. So I loved Speak Now, Taylor's version. I missed the little giggle that she had in it. Do you remember that? No. What are you talking about? God, what am I thinking of? Okay. Don't you worry, you're a pretty little mine. People throw rocks at things that shine and I... I think that's it. She giggled in it, the original one, and she didn't in the next one. What song is that? Ours? Live. Yeah, yeah, ours. Yeah, Girl, she left out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to go down the rabbit hole then. I don't know what you're talking yeah. about. But I loved it, and I like, and I love 1989, um, Taylor's version. I just wish... I wish we would have gotten more vaults because those vaults were fucking fire. I don't think it's over now. Why would you, you end the whole? No, fuck no. Is it over now? Is the last track? No, it's not over, Taylor. And I, I'm, I think the glitch is going to be the double 1989. And I know. I mean, you guys can shit on me. I believe um, you. I've done tons yeah. of videos on it. I'm, I I'm there too. I'm not Where over is it, it though? I'm not over it. Um, I don't know. And just the fact that the, the imagery was all beachy and very different than the original 1989. And then do you remember how like it kind of got like storm imagery, like each of the merch drops, the background of the merch started out like a, a normal day at the beach. And then they got like darker as if a storm was coming in. And, um, what is, there's a line about that storms. I mean, first off, 1909 had lightning everywhere. It was the theme was lightning, right? You've got like the Wildest Dreams had lightning in the music video. Mm -hmm. Style had lightning in the music video. You also had the Coachella jacket that she wore in the summer of 2016 with the lightning strike on the back representing the Calvin Harris, Rihanna. This is what you came for. Like there was lightning theme happening. And I just felt like, like that was the storm of the 1989 Taylor's version like uh, the illustrations kind of getting stormy. I was like, the dark version's coming. <laughs> We're getting the second version. I could see, I could see it being like a rock version with like collabs. Yeah. But like, yeah. where is it? <laughs> you know, she had to pit stop into Heartbreak Town for us. We're going to get, um, we're going to get our, our little emotional hearts just torn apart for a little bit here for the spring. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe we'll get it in the fall. Maybe that will be the big. I'm on board with it. I thought there were way too many clues that there was a double 1989. Mm -hmm. Way too many. Way too many. So, and obviously Torture Poets was a surprise. So it's really, you know, to me, I don't think we've gotten the glitch yet. If the glitch mm -mm. is something, I don't think we've gotten it yet. Me either. We're going to know. It's something you're going to know when we get the glitch. Yeah, like a double 1989. Yes. <laughs> like a year I, like a year later. 
I'm all for it. Maybe on the um, anniversary. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So then that brings us to two, four of 24 at the Grammys. When she won her 13th Grammy, she got up there and announced TS11, the tortured poets department and shocked the whole world. Yep. Um, announcing a brand new album in the middle of a tour. I am on the fence on whether she's adding Tortured Poets as a set. I don't think she's going to. A lot of people think she is. I don't know. I think it's. I think it'd be too weird to change up the set now, especially because there's a movie. What do you mean there's a movie? Oh, the Eras Tour movie. Yeah. I'm like, Tortured Poets is getting a movie? What? Um, yeah, I think you're right. I would be surprised if she does. It will be a short one, maybe, maybe two or three songs. And, um, you know, we could be completely off. It's not like we know anything, but um, I just, I don't know. We'll see. I do think what um, what we are missing here with the timeline, too. So if you guys are listening and um, you're not going in order, right, we actually did talk a little bit about the scooter and the deal that he just recently, like this past couple weeks, made with UMG, which is the umbrella company that owns Taylor's current record company and her label and all the production and stuff is done under the UMG umbrella. And so there was news that Scooter, who is now the CEO of Hybe Corp for the uh, North American division, he signed a deal with UMG. He's seen with Lucian Grange, who is the CEO of UMG or whatever. He's the top dog at UMG, who Taylor has been photographed with and is personally thanked. And so um, it is a little interesting. So I don't know. There might be more that comes out. Um, if you want to go back to the last episode, um, I did label it. It's like Scooter Hive UMG. It's really easy to find if you want to kind of catch that. But that was an interesting thing to roll out during this time when we're doing the masters. And then of course we still owe you guys a lyrical analysis. So the three parts were who are Scott and who is Scooter Braun, kind of some foundational stuff. We did the timeline in two parts here. So we did part two and then part three. We talked about Hybe and UMG on last week's episode, and now we owe you some lyrical analysis. I know we've been kind of tinkering with that as we talk through. Jesse and I will fully record that and release that. Hopefully in the next week, we'll just do a surprise drop on you. Maybe Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of next week. I'd like to get it out before Tortured Poets because I'd yeah. like you guys to be able to listen to Tortured Poets and only focus on that. We're not going to come back to the masters. But what's interesting is there will probably be lyrics and ties to this masters saga on Tortured Poet, so it'll be nice to have that episode out so you guys can listen for some of it as well. And out of this whole debacle, the lyrical analysis and what songs are about who, about the work or Scooter Braun or Scott Borchetta, this is my favorite part. So you guys yes. are gonna wanna watch that. It's gonna be super interesting. Yeah, thank you for it. Yeah, we're, we're surprised dropping it. We're going to throw it out. But please do not think that we are half ass in it or that it's one that is skip worthy because you are correct in that. And that's actually why we didn't want to do it during this episode, because we wanted to give it a full episode. Like there's a lot that we're going to discuss. So yeah, you'll be it, it would be overwhelming if we did it right now. Yep. Yep. So, all right, well, let's get into some topics from this week. So, um, like I mentioned, we are filming on Monday. So if there's something that has come out and you want to hear about it, just catch us on TikTok. We've got Jesse Swift Talk. I'm at Creative Chronicles. And then we've got the TS Pod Network. Um, but one thing that did happen that we definitely want to touch on is Taylor released the five Apple Music playlists, each representing it's the five stages of grief, but I think she called it the five stages of heartbreak, which stood out to me. Um, and then a lot of people saying like, oh my gosh, that confirms the theory, that confirms the theory. It was in the, so if you go to Apple Music and if you're not a subscriber, I signed up for three months free, which I better fucking remember to like cancel it, but I needed to hear it. Um, but there is a description that was written, it's written by Apple Music, but it's like on behalf of Taylor. And it does mention the theory and that Taylor had heard the theory and that she was leaning into it. Do you have that pulled up? Do you want to, should we read I it real do, quick? I do. Um, so it's not necessarily that the variants are the five stages of grief. Now, whoever came up with that is brilliant though, because Love it. I do think that 
this album is going to take us to, through the straight stages of grief of her relationship. I do think this album is the majority is going to be about Joe Alwyn. Um, but the different, okay. So you have five different playlists that Taylor made for Apple and she's done, I've had Apple music forever and she's done this before. She left a message for each one. One is I love you. It's ruining my life songs. So that one was kind of the denial. Like you're not, she said something about like being in something and not seeing the red flags, maybe like being in that lavender haze. So the songs that are on that number one, the first song, lavender haze. So then the second playlist she has is, am I allowed to cry songs? And that is her in the bargaining stage. Then she has, you don't get to tell me about sad songs. Um, this one she explained as her anger, her anger phase. And I'm probably saying these out of order, but these are yeah, just what anger they are. is second and then bargaining is third. It doesn't really matter, but just for if you're actually talking about the stages of grief. And she does list second, third, and first in all of them. Yeah. Um, old habits die screaming. This one she had said was kind of the depression stage of it okay and then i can do it with a broken heart songs and that one is what am i missing acceptance acceptance yeah that one's acceptance yeah so, so one thing is on each of them so if you have apple music and you open up the bio i do want to read what sh what was written by apple music because i think it's really important for those who think that this is confirming a theory versus what i think she really is doing which is leaning into a theory and using it as an opportunity to give us more context into what we're headed into so it says when taylor swift announces an album the world takes interest that's certainly what happened in the days after she unveiled the tortured poets department as intrepid Swifties began hunting and assembling and pinning clues to digital cork boards, eventually landing on the theory that the 11th studio album is sure to explore the five stages of heartbreak. So that's what I'm saying. She didn't say grief. She said five stages of heartbreak. And when Swifties agree upon a theory, Taylor takes an interest. So naturally, she's responded by crafting a series of exclusive playlists, choosing songs of her own that fit each stage. And then if you read, each of them then has a second paragraph that talks about, like this one says, the fifth and final stage is acceptance, right? So I think what's important there is that it's clear that this is her leaning into the theory. She heard the theory, she's going to do this, because in my opinion, if this was planned, she would have had five variants. And so I wouldn't expect that the songs that go with the different variants or whatever the poem is on the back of the vinyl, I wouldn't expect that to be the theme. Although I do think the, the Black Dog will be depression. We talked about that. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't necessarily know if that's a one to one. And if it is, then we're missing acceptance because acceptance, the playlist didn't get a poem. If you didn't know those playlist titles were pulled directly from the back of the vinyls. So each variant had a different like little, I wouldn't even call it a poem. It's more of just like a mini phrase. And so since she didn't have five variants, she didn't have five poems, that final playlist, which represents acceptance is actually just an album or not an album. It's actually just a song title from the tortured poets department. And that's, I can do it with a broken heart, which is a great fit, right? It, it makes sense. So that's where I start to wonder if she kind of pieces together after the fact, once we got on theory land. Um, and I love it because it really does confirm people's probably fears that this is going to be a tragic album. But I do think it helps maybe give us some time to to sit in the current discography and understand some context before we get into this. Yeah, because some of the songs in these playlists are just heartbreaking on their own. I really think this new album is going to destroy us. I can't wait. I know, Down me for too. Good destroy. Um, Okay, so let's real quick just go through each and talk about any surprises. So starting with the first stage of grief or heartbreak, it, I love you, it's ruining my life, which is going to be denial. I thought this was so interesting because in the message she said denial or delusion. She also referenced ignoring red flags. Like some of that stuff was like, oh, okay, okay, we're saying it. You were in a state of delusion for some of this, so... 
Well, and I think specifically to Joe, she had a um, TikTok video up when she came out with Midnight's about Lavender Haze and said, you know, I've been with my partner for six years and we, you know, you do anything to stay in that Lavender Haze, which could have been what she's referring to as a red flag because that's track one on this playlist. So maybe that to her being in that bubble with him was safe and comforting, but really in reality, it might have been a red flag. Well, and just the need to like go back to like how it began, because she said that she learned that from Mad Men, like that was one of the inspiration. And when it was used in Mad Men, the the TV show, it was talking about like those early phases of a relationship, that lavender haze. And it's like when you're six years in, you shouldn't really be craving that. Um, you know, it, it does kind of seem weird that, you know, she's trying to get back to those beginning phase stages. And I even think, you know, when she sings in Midnight Rain and she's like, he wanted it comfortable. I wanted that pain. Like she was, she was aching to feel. Sometimes you fight with your partner to feel something, to make them feel like they care again. Um, if you're doing that, that's probably not normal, but like, that's not something you would do in a long-term healthy relationship. It's more like those early stages where you're trying to figure each other out and you're, you're trying to understand, like, is this something that's going to work? And so I always thought that Lavender Haze was um, kind of an anxious attachment song. And what's so funny is a lot of people really blamed the fans for for taking her out of the haze, right? There was a lot of conversation about like, oh, why do people think they need to get married? And like, oh, like if you're constantly trying to like understand what's happening in their relationship, like she wants to keep it private. When she talked about like the 1950s and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. so now I kind of am glad that this was on this playlist because I think it dispels that feeling that was the, was she trying to say in the lavender haze because she was trying to protect herself from the fandom and talk about peace, you know, like how she, she wanted to um, be in a relationship where that outside world didn't exist or was she trying to stay in the lavender haze because she felt unloved it's that's a good point i wonder if she kind of contradicts herself a little bit though because in lavender haze she talks about you know you either want a one night or a wife and it's very like feminist and i don't need to get married but then you have you're losing me where she says you know i wouldn't marry me either pathological people pleaser so i really do think she wanted to get married. I think that that was on the table and she was just delusional justifying it maybe. Yeah, and I don't I never took that line as her saying that it was wrong for people to think that. I think she's saying like she wants to go back to the portion of cuz when you're early in a relationship when the media was saying like oh it's only one night or a a wife, that's mm -hmm. normal. 6 years in that's not like, I just always thought some of the lines, even going to the Lover album, I just remember being like, this is a beautiful song for early stages of a relationship. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm hmm. Some of the song choices, too, on this delusional red flag playlist are interesting because you have Snow on the Beach, which is a lot like Lavender Haze. Um, Sweet Nothing that she wrote with Joe and Glitch, which we need to note. Yep. But she's got Lover on here. I mean. Well, and I want to pause because Sweet Nothing, she wrote with Joe. You and I have had this conversation offline a ton. I'm not convinced that William Bowery means he sat down and wrote a song with her because of the way that she's done songwriting in the past. Like she said that with um, Blank Space, like she got a lot of the the melodies on it from things that she had already written in her journal over the years. She like went back and like grabbed good quips. And so like Darling, I'm a Nightmare Dressed Like a Daydream was probably something she had written down at one point. And so when she was writing that song, she went back and pulled. And so I start to question if some of the songs, I'm not saying every song that William Bowery wrote with her, Joe, um, were this way, but I could see where if he helped her write something from a poem or start start something, if she used it, then did she credit him? But is she, th does that mean though that she's going to credit him on a lot of songs on Tortured Poets? Because I bet she's going to take a lot from, you know, conversations Patience, they've had. You've said that before on here, haven't you? That you yeah. wouldn't be surprised if he's credited. Yeah. Yeah. I could see that. Um, well, and it depends on like where she draws the line. Like, did he have to say it to her or did he write it down with her or, 
you know, to your point, maybe they really did sit down and kumbaya around the piano. Who knows? Um, but I also think she um, would be more than willing to credit somebody who had any inkling of writing with her because she's very protective of when you know she wrote the song herself and when somebody else played a part. She's got Betty on this playlist, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my biggest surprise was obviously Lover. I think a lot of people feel that way. And Lover is a beautiful love song. Again, early in a relationship. I love it for like, if you are just starting to date somebody or you're you're thinking maybe marriage is going to be the end game and to think like, you know, can I go where you go? Can we always be this close forever and ever? Like, there is nothing wrong with still thinking of that song and thinking of it as a love song. I think that's something that I've seen a lot online where people are like completely recategorizing these things. And it is interesting to note that that is something that you probably wouldn't say years into relationship. Like, can we always be this close? Like, of course, dude, like we've, you know, we've already done six summers together, like, or whatever she said, three summers now. Um, but I do think that it's just, just be careful if you're somebody who's like kind of torn up about changing meanings of songs. It doesn't mean the song changed meaning. It just categorizes where she was at in her life when she wrote it. I saw something online that had me literally gagged. And it was that when she says, and at every table, I'll save you a seat, lover. And I always thought that was such a beautiful, romantic line. But now what if we're looking at it from the standpoint of he's never there with her at events and she's going to save him that seat anyway, just in case he shows up? Yeah. Oh, like, that's like yeah. gut wrenching. Well, and also like, I don't know. I just, uh, again, it's just like, I always thought Lover was so weird. My husband and I started dating right around the time that Lover came out. And that's why I think it's so weird because songs like Cornelia Street, I Hope I Never Lose You, I Hope It Never Ends. I love that song. That reminds me of our early days of like realizing like, no, like, like please don't let this end. This is what it's supposed to be. And luckily, uh, I got the ring and we're fucking married and he's not going anywhere. Um, Mm -hmm. But that was a feeling that is natural to have in early stages of relationship. And again, I I, at the time questioned, why is Taylor writing music that is mirroring where I'm at in my relationship, which was very early? Anxiety. Mm Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know. Okay, let's go to the next one. The next one was what anger? What comes next? Yeah, anger is the next one. So the don't get you don't get to tell me about sad songs. Exile is on here. That one stuck out to me because that's one that they wrote together. Yeah, um, and it, it's one of those songs that I could see, like it, from an anger standpoint, it makes sense, but it's also not overtly angry. The, well, another thing we need to say here, too, is not all these songs are about Joe. She didn't contextualize the Joe relationship no. for us. She put songs all the way going back to um, Fearless. She left off all debut and reputation because clearly those are not songs that she owns and she doesn't want us um, streaming them. So I just think that it's it's interesting to look at the ones when they were together and think, OK, you know, in the years leading up to this album, we're about to get where are we at? <laughs> Well, and I think she just wanted us to make, like, wanted to make a mad album for us, like, or playlist, like, of her angry songs or whatever. But you know what also sticks out to me here with all the rumors that have gone gone around is Illicit Affairs. Yeah, I liked that Illicit Affairs was on Angry because I always really thought that that was a beautiful song. But then when she sang it on tour, Angry, it's a different song. Like, it's fucking good. I need that version. Yeah. Like, can we, can we, like, you know how we got all too well 10 minute for, like, you know, being annoying and Taylor finally being like, fine, you can have it. Illicit Affairs, the angry version we need. That song goes hard. Yeah. All right. After Anger is um, Bargaining, Am I Allowed to Cry? The Great War Man. That's my favorite. I love that song. That's one I really, that one has a lot of layers to it. Um, a lot of layers of different things. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that she tucked Renegade at the end of this one, too, because yeah. Renegade is by Big Red Machine, so it's not even really on any of her albums. And it is, I mean, if you guys haven't listened to Renegade, 
It's fantastic, especially if you're like a folklore Evermore Swifty. Go listen to it. It belongs on one of those albums. It's the same kind of, you know, vibe. Yeah. What was written for for those albums, but then they decided it fit better on Big Red Machine's album. How long do you think it's going to last is the name of that album. Taylor actually came up with the name and... It's just so... She came up with the name of how long do you think it's going to last? What yeah. t- what year did that come up? At? Like 2021? Um, It was right after Evermore. So it'd be 2020 or 2021. Well, Evermore came out in December. So yeah. Yeah. That's fucked up. If that was an album name she came up with. Yeah. She came up with it. And she's on two songs in it. Birch and Renegade. And she actually wrote Renegade. Um, And Renegade's full of anxiety. And it's a lot like You're Losing Me. Yeah, Renegade, that should have been a telltale sign that shit was hitting the fan. And we Um, didn't know because we were all, I think we're all in this, at least for me, I was in this puff cloud of like, she found her person. Like Joe's perfect for her. Oh my God, I'm so happy for her. Like everything's like rainbows and roses. And you look and it's, it's not, it really wasn't. Yeah, I never really, like, cared about Joe. Like, I didn't hate him or like him. Like, it's just, like, he was just a part of who she was, but, like, not a defining portion of how I experienced her as a fan. Mm -hmm. Um, So, to me, I just believed her when she said these songs were part fiction, you know? And I'm like, maybe she is, like, so happy and content that now she needs to write story because she can't pull from her real life anymore because her real life is steady and normal. Yeah. Okay, then the next one would be Old Habits Die Screaming, which is depression. I think it's interesting Maroon is on here. I never really saw that as a depression song, but now I guess I guess it is. What are your thoughts on Coney Island? That's one of your favorites. Oof, that is one of my favorites. Coney Island. Um, that is got some depressive like undertones to it and grief. I mean, like she literally goes through her relationships, you know, and says what happened, the catalyst that broke the relationship. Like when I stepped mm-hmm. up to the podium, I think I forgot to say your name, Calvin Harris. Were you standing with a big cake down the hallway? That was, J- you know, Jake Dylan Hall. I mean, it's such a fabulous song. All right. And then the last one, I can do it with a broken heart. So this is obviously going to be the acceptance stage. Um, These ones didn't really surprise me. I love that she started it with You're On Your Own Kid, because Mm -hmm. that is obviously a very important song to her. And it is a song of acceptance. Yep. Clean. And then the one is on there. And that's the song that they changed from Invisible String to the one Mm -hmm. on tour. And Invisible yeah. Strings on there, too. Yeah, I, I did hear some discourse about Invisible String being on there because that's one of those love song type things. And maybe it's coming from the place of accepting that, like, like Joe was meant to come into her life and maybe leave eventually. And a lesson learned. I mean, it, it's people come into our life for a reason, a season or what, whatever the saying is, you know. Yeah, definitely. Um, so what were your thoughts when this came out though? Like, did you, cause for me, I was driving and I like legitimately signed up for Apple, uh, music subscription, the free trial. I fucking don't know. I just had to listen. To, I had to listen to them. Um, and so for me, I was like, I remember driving and being like, what is happening? What is happening right now? Like fucking like, she's not really done anything like this before. Yeah. Um, she, I wanted to listen to the messages first, um, to see if there were any clues or something in her messages. The last time she did something like this was when she created the playlist for the quill pen, glitter gel pen, fountain pen. So that's the last time she did it and had a message for each one. But yeah, so it it is interesting. But that didn't recontextualize songs for us. That's what I mean by she's never done anything like this before and that she's very hush about the meaning behind stuff. She lets us figure it out. True. She lets us interpret it the way that we need to interpret it in our lives. She doesn't tell us who the songs are about. She doesn't usually go back in time. And that's why When You're Losing Me was finally dropped officially on streaming. And then Jack released that um, story where he said exactly the date it was written. 
that was weird. We don't usually get that level of detail. And so for her to have said like, these are songs that I wrote when I was in a stage of denial or delusion, you're like, I, that to me, that's why I was in shock. Cause I'm like, she is telling us more. Like, if you think about any great artist in history, you don't usually get that level of detail, especially after the fact of what really drew the inspiration to the song. Hmm. Yeah. Agreed. It's it. I think she's definitely this more than anything else. I mean, we all knew Red was about Jake Gyllenhaal pretty much, but we know this is going to be about Joel Alwyn. And maybe Scooter Braun and Scott Bruschetta. Who knows, guys? Maybe, maybe some Maddie later Healy might there. have a song or two in there. Yeah. Yeah. Very exciting. Should we punt over to our draft then and <gasps> do our final picks? Yes, I'm so oh excited. God. All right. So we have been doing what we're calling TTP draft. And shout out to those of you who have done your own. We've got tagged in a couple. And oh my gosh, it makes me so happy. So Jesse and I have been going through and basically picking a team, right? Because there's 20 songs on the Tortured Poets Department, if you include all the bonus tracks. And we are making our own little teams of 10. So we're just picking songs blindly. Like we have the name of the track so we could guess what we think it's going to be. And if it's going to be a good one, we know what number it is, which is another clue if it's going to be good. They're all going to be good, let's be clear. But at the very end, we are going to have it on our website. You can actually see it now. It's tspodnetwork.com backslash draft. But on the day that Tortured Poets is released, we will be opening up a poll where you could vote on which of our teams you like better now that you've heard the music. So we're just going to finish out the draft just knowing that it's literally coming out next week and we're going to call them all out now. So I will start with the pick um, because Jesse got like first pick overall and then we'll kind of go back and forth. And they, just a question, they don't have just the day it comes out. It'll go for a couple of weeks, right? Oh, good point. Yes, yes. You can, we'll leave it open probably all year, honestly, because then people can watch this back and, and Ooh, go yeah. vote. If you're watching this in July, go vote. <laughs> maybe we'll end it on maybe New one Year's of us Eve. will come back. What'd you say? We'll end it on New Year's Eve. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> all right, so as a recap, Jesse has track one, Fortnite, track two, The Tortured Poets Department, track six, But Daddy, I Love Him, and the bonus track of The Black Dog. And then I have So Long London, which is a track five, snagged that one. Track eight, which is Florida with Florence and the Machine. I also have track 12, which is L-O-M-L, or like I like to call it LOM. (laughs) And then my last one that I've already claimed is track 16, Clara Bow. So, oh, I haven't thought through this one enough. Um, I think I'm gonna choose the manuscript. Oh, good one. Good one. That's a good one. I know. Okay. I am going with track 13. I can do it with a broken heart because 13 is Damn a it. I number. really wanted that one. 13 is her favorite number. And I can do it with a broken heart was one of the names of the playlist. So it's got to be special. Yeah. Fuck! I did. I just messed up. I messed up critically because I've always said that's uh, that's tolerated part two because uh, you know break free and leave us in ruin. Take this <laughs> dagger and me and remove it. Believe yeah. me, I could do it. I can do it with a broken heart. <laughs> <laughs> this is so fun. Oh my god! Damn it! I'm so mad at myself. This We're is gonna- why I shouldn't be like making notes over here. I need to be thinking. Okay. Mm. We're going to have to do this for every album eventually. Yeah. Well, even if it's not coming out, we'll just do yeah. it. Although it does, it it stings more whenever you don't know if it's good or not. Right. Um. Okay, your fresh turn. Fresh out of the slammer. I got to have fresh out of the slammer. That one looks fucking good. Fresh out the slammer. Good one. Oh, yeah. I added an of there. It's fresh out the slammer. Oh, my goodness. Okay. I know what I'm going to pick. Are you ready for it? Yeah. I'm going to scoop up the albatross. Fuck. I knew you would want that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) If you do the albatross, then I've got to take the other last bonus track that's still available, which is the bolter. Damn. I knew you were going to. You're not going to get three of the four bonus tracks. (sighs) 
Okay. My turn? Yeah. I'm going to go track nine, Guilty as Sin, because it's okay. in Carolina. I Guilty like as it. Sin, Sleep in a Liar's Bed. Oof. That one's going to cut. I think I need to take, you're going to be mad at me. I can fix him. No, really, I can. That'll be a good one. I feel like that's got to be, that's got to be a good one. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I am going to go with alchemy. Damn it, Jesse. Okay. I mean, they're all good. I don't, I don't know, know why I'm mad at you. Like, you have no to ma- be able to choose them. No matter well, how many I- times <laughs> people explain what alchemy is to me, I don't understand it. But I feel like it's it- going to be important. It's related to like uh, like astrology now too. Like I like read it as just like the the turning of gold or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, maybe maybe Taylor will teach us what alchemy means. Oh, I'm sure she will. Um, I feel like I need the smallest man who ever lived. Okay. Why do I think that's going to be about Maddie Healy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go with who's afraid of little old me because I think it's a play on Virginia Woolf. Okay. Okay. All right. So the only two that we have left are my boy breaks his favorite toys and down bad. Mm. Uh, I think I need to do number three. My boy only breaks his favorite toys. Something about down bad doesn't sit with me. And I know everyone's really excited about it. It's just, it's not giving me enough in the title. That was that's fine because I would have picked down bad. I figured you would have. So I was like trying to figure out did I want to like slight you and take the good one or you could go with my gut. Go with my gut. Nope, we're good. So we've got it split. All right. Oh so my guys gosh. <laughs> I'm so excited. That was so fun. Yeah, and we'll do this more often. We'll do more drafts and and have opportunities for you guys to vote on stuff. Maybe like we talked about drafting, maybe like track ones or you know, whatever. Yeah. We could um, sit here and do it with like 1989 TV and like each of us pick one that we love and then have people vote on, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like who has the better favorites. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I love it. I love it. All right. So those will be up on the tspodnetwork.com website. You'll just do backslash draft or we have like a link to it as well once you get to the homepage. Um, and then on April 19th, go on there and vote. You're welcome to sleuth the site in the meantime, if you want to just see the full list of what each of us has. Um, okay. And we also have more with the masters. So we will be recording the lyrical analysis portion here soon and dropping that the week of tortured poets coming out. So maybe Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday ahead of the album release. So definitely keep an eye out for that. We'll tell you on TikTok when we're releasing it. And then, of course, we have KJ joining us for the April 19th release. Obviously, we're not super women and we can't record our reactions, edit and post it that same day. So that's more of just a fun episode talking about being Swifties, talking about excitement around the album. So definitely join us on the day of the album release. And then Jesse and I have a lot going on. We will definitely have to put videos up. We will do our best to be timely with reactions, with extra content. So just hang tight after the release of Torture Poets Department because we're going to have, we're going to be like running like a freight train. I just know it. Yeah, you guys will get our our initial reactions because when we record after Tortured Poets, it's still going to be fresh and fairly new. Yeah. Yeah, there's like the first time you hear the lyric reaction, which we'll film, but there's also like the now that I've had time to sit with it reaction mm-hmm. as well. Our first analysis. And that might be different on how we feel like three or four weeks later too. Yep. Yep. And so as a reminder, if we want to be able to do reaction videos and include music on our YouTube, we need to be at least a thousand subscribers or more just because that puts us at a level where we get access to additional things like copyright. So please, please, please go subscribe to our YouTube if you haven't already. Give us five stars on all of the different podcast networks that you listen to us on and just know that we appreciate you. We are we are going to be so busy this next couple weeks and we are doing it all for you guys. We are mm-hmm. so thrilled to have started a podcast in the year of the Tortured Poets Department. So just hang tight. Keep tuned in with all of our socials. We'll keep you up to date on where we're at and what we're releasing. We will continue to have Friday episodes, but there's going to be a lot more coming out. So stick with us and we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.